Well, hi there. This is a poor beagle shark, which from all appearances is just a mini great white shark. This is a basking shark, the second largest of all living sharks. This is the tooth of a megalodon, possibly the largest shark that has ever lived. And this is a goblin shark, one of the weirdest, though possibly not even the weirdest shark in this one order of sharks, the Lamniformes mackerel sharks, which is quite possibly the coolest order of sharks, meaning it might be the coolest order of animals on the planet. And today, I want to introduce you to every species of mackerel sharks alive today and how they're related. The Lamniformes are identifiable by the presence of both a primary and secondary dorsal fin, as well as an anal fin, five gill slits on each side of their heads, and the lack of a protective nictitating membrane that can be closed over the eye. This is in addition to the features typical of sharks, such as a cartilaginous skeleton, multiple rows of teeth, a huge fatty liver to increase buoyancy, pectoral fins positioned to the side like wings to generate lift because they're heavier than water, as well as electrical sensing pits called ampullae de Lorenzini, and a pressure sensing lateral line. Also, like other sharks, they have internal fertilization using claspers located behind the pelvic fins of males to transfer sperm inside of the body cavity of females. Like many other sharks, the eggs hatch inside of the female. This is called ovovivipary. But fascinatingly, in this group, after the babies run out of yolk, they stay inside of the mother, feeding on unfertilized eggs that the mother provides. This is called oophagy, egg eating. All sharks are rad, but I would argue that the 15 species of Lamniformes sharks are the raddest of them all, at least as a group. And that is possibly because the great white shark is my favorite shark of all. And if you would like to see me swim with one in the wild, please consider supporting us on Patreon to make that possible. Now, I have to tell you that I was a bit surprised when I learned that the Lamniform sharks do not have a nictitating membrane. I could have sworn that I had seen great white sharks close their eyes when attacking prey. Was this the Mandela effect that people were referencing all over the comments of our video about whales? Well, let's dive into this group and see if we can get to the bottom of this mystery and discover all seven lamniform families and 15 species that make this order, small as it may be, the coolest order of sharks that there is. Today's video is sponsored by not just the Ridge wallet, but actually a host of red Ridge products that are available now, including this new key carrier, which allows you to uh, one by one rotate into position your keys, not unlike the teeth of a shark, if you really think about it. And I gotta say, like this thing is a pretty smooth little unit. You can clip it onto your pants or, you know, right on the edge of your pocket. You can also hang it. It's so slick. I, I really didn't know what to make of this when I first saw it. And now that I've used it, it's really cool. And you can actually get it bundled with the Ridge Wallet if you don't already have one. They are guaranteed for life. So if you have one, I mean, you you have one for the rest of your life. But if you wanted it to match or you didn't have a Ridge Wallet, you could get them together as part of what is called the Daily Driver Kit. And uh, I think that's stinking rad. And if you want to save some money, you can even go to our exclusive link, ridge.com slash Clint, and save up to 40% there. Oh, and by the way, speaking of things in the 40s, you can keep the Ridge Wallet for up to 45 days just to see if you like it. And if you don't, you can send it back, but you, you'll you probably like it. Because I honestly, when I first test drove mine, I thought, well, I'll give it a try. And here we are several years later, still driving it. That's ridge.com slash Clint. The family most distantly related to all of the other lamniform sharks is the family Mystic Urinidae, which is a heck of a place to start because the only species in this family has got to be one of the weirdest sharks on the planet, the goblin shark. Now at first, the goblin shark looks, well, pretty weird. I wanted to say it looks pretty normal, but it doesn't. It mostly looks weird because it has a very long rostrum, even for a shark. It's also pink and has nostrils that look like a pair of forward facing straws. But I wanted to say that it looks pretty normal because as odd as it looks most of the time, it is capable of a whole different level of bizarre when it goes to bite something. Not to mention that they are the fastest fish jaws in the world. So why are they so weird? 
Well, for one thing, they hunt in pretty deep waters where not much light is present. They have eyes, but smell and electrical detection are probably more important for their ability to find prey. This explains the extreme and very directional nostrils and the long rostrum covered in Ampullae de Lorencini. It also probably explains why little energy is invested in skin pigmentation. Now those jaws. Sharks generally have jaws that are not directly attached to their skull, enabling them to protrude forward. This helps them get out towards the front of the body, since those jaws are usually recessed behind the snout. It also allows sharks to hunt using suction feeding, something that we discussed in great detail in this video. And like I said, it is the fastest jaw movement of any fish, though I would like to see them jaw race a frogfish. But it is surprising to see them move something so quickly because they are one of the least graceful swimmers of all sharks. Most grow to be between 3 and 4 meters, but some have been observed over 6 meters, or about 20 feet long. The next most distantly related family is the family of sharks with all of the sharks I have ever claimed as my favorites. The family Lamnidae, the white sharks. Lamnid sharks can be identified, well, first of all, by the fact that they look like great white sharks. And most of us know what great white sharks look like. But to be more specific, White sharks are heavy-bodied sharks weighing, in many cases, twice as much as other sharks of similar length. They have pointed snouts, big teeth and eyes, and all five gill openings in front of the pectoral fins. Their dorsal fins are large, but their secondary dorsal fins and anal fins are very small. And they have a very distinctive lateral keel on the caudal peduncle, where the caudal fin attaches to the tail. This gives a great deal of strength and stability to the tail, as these are the fastest swimming sharks in existence. They are distinctively countershaded, meaning that they are dark on top and light on the bottom. This makes them very difficult to spot for both animals looking up at them from below, against a bright background, and those looking down at them from above, against a dark background. Though they're only white sharks when looking up at them from below. And I have a hard time telling you that these are not the coolest animals on Earth. But which of the five species is the coolest? Let's start with the obvious favorite. The white shark that, if not the coolest, is clearly great. The great white shark. Now let's face it, it's probably the coolest. For one thing, it's the biggest of the white sharks, with males averaging a length approaching 4 meters and females nearly 5. Some over 6, that's 20 feet and around 5,000 pounds, well over 2,000 kilograms. A giant that feeds primarily on pinnipeds like seals and sea lions, sometimes by throwing their entire 20-foot, 5,000-pound bodies out of the water though they will also feed on just about any other large animal that they can catch. One huge adaptation that allows them to catch prey like pinnipeds is that they're able to keep their body temperatures elevated, especially in their brains, sense organs, and swimming muscles. This is achieved due to their size and countercurrent blood flow through structures called Reit Mirable. Like tegu lizards, they do not do this all of the time, but they are capable of elevating their body temperatures far above that of the surrounding water when it's most advantageous. It can be identified by its relatively blunt snout, sharp transition from white to dark, triangular serrated teeth, black tips to the ventral side of the pectoral fins, and general grayish coloration. But I think the big question is, do they blink? And the answer is no. They don't have a nictitating membrane. So why did I think that I saw them blink? The answer is because they do have a way to protect their eyes when they bite things, which is highly beneficial because seals and sea lions can do a lot of damage when you try to eat one alive. Give it a try if you don't believe me. And the way that they protect their eye is by rolling it back into their heads, exposing a bunch of white connective tissue, but not an eyelid, because they don't have one. And speaking of their eyes... You know the thing about a shark, he's got lifeless eyes. Black eyes, like a doll's eye. When he comes at you, he doesn't seem to be living until he bites you. And those black eyes roll over white. Well, it turns out that if you get a good look at those lifeless black doll's eyes, it turns out that they aren't black at all. They're blue. And if you get the lighting just right, not only can you see that they're blue, but you can see that they aren't lifeless either. 
they're quite expressive. Which, finding out that great white sharks have big, blue, expressive eyes has me feeling more connected to great white sharks than ever. Of course, I don't necessarily relate that much to being huge and powerful. I'm more lean and fast. There's a reason that The Flash is my favorite DC superhero. And all of the other white sharks are faster than the great white. The fastest of them all being the mako shark. Specifically, the short-finned mako shark, which have been observed swimming at speeds up to 31 miles per hour, making them the fastest of all sharks. And for good reason, these guys hunt the fastest of all fish, marlins, sailfishes, swordfishes, and tuna, as well as other fast animals like dolphins, cephalopods like squids, porpoises, sea turtles, birds, and other sharks. Unlike their cousins, the great white sharks, the makos tend to be out in the open ocean, as opposed to hugging the coastlines in search of pinnipeds. They're also somewhat smaller, though they can be well over three meters, with females being larger than males. Some big females may exceed four meters. But they're not nearly as big as the mako sharks in the movie Deep Blue Sea, which are more the size of great white sharks. The shark in Deep Blue Sea was also much heavier bodied than actual mako sharks, with a much blunter snout, wider teeth, and a very sharp transition from the dorsal color to the white belly. It looked like a great white shark. Makos are much leaner overall, have a pointier snout, thinner teeth that do become somewhat wider and larger individuals as they begin to prey more on larger vertebrates, and a gradual transition from the dark back to the white belly. That said, the shark in the movie is more of a blue than a gray, which is the case for makos, and the sharks were very intelligent, which makos are for sure. They have the largest brain-to-body ratio of any shark. So it isn't that difficult to distinguish makos from great whites. And it isn't difficult to distinguish long-finned makos from short-finned makos, because long-finned makos have really long, like humpback whale level long, pectoral fins. This probably enables them to use less energy when swimming, as sharks are heavier than water and use the pectoral fins for lift so they don't sink. Sinking in the open ocean is just not an option, which means you must be continuously swimming, like Dory said. More lift means you don't need as much thrust, less energy. But those big wings also slow them down, so they are slower than their short-finned cousins which must eat far more than other sharks their size because they use so much energy swimming and warming their bodies. The remaining two white sharks are not as easy to distinguish from a great white. These would be the poor beagle shark and the salmon shark, which both look very much like small great whites, especially the poor beagle shark, which I am tempted to call my favorite shark. It's just a tiny great white. Tiny may be a stretch. These sharks get to be between about two and two and a half meters, with females, again, being larger than males, some even reaching lengths of about three meters. Much smaller than great whites, but still pretty impressive if you see one swimming towards you. It is pretty easy to distinguish between the two because salmon sharks are in the northern Pacific Ocean, and poor beagle sharks are in the North Atlantic and South Pacific. Also, salmon sharks have spotted bellies, unlike poor beagle sharks or their cousins, the great whites. Poor beagle sharks look more like mini great whites, but can be distinguished by a white spot on the dorsal fin at the bottom of their trailing edge, as well as a less dramatic change from dark to light. Both salmon sharks and poor beagle sharks also have a more rounded dorsal fin and two heels at the caudal peduncle, as opposed to the one possessed by great whites. Their teeth are also unserrated, though if you're in a position to see that clearly, either you or the shark are having a terrible day. The top lobe of their caudal fin is also somewhat larger than the bottom, more so than in great whites, but nowhere near as much as the next most distantly related lamniform shark, the three thresher shark species of the family Alopiidae, because the top lobe of their caudal fins is comically ginormous. It can be as long as the entire rest of their bodies, and they use it to slap fish. How wonderful is that? I guess it depends on whether or not you are a fish swimming out in the open ocean. But that is where threshers are found, slapping fish with their giant caudal fin lobes. While there may be a fourth species out there, there are three species currently known. The common thresher, the pelagic thresher, and the big eye thresher. 
The common thresher is the largest of the three, sometimes coming in at six meters, which is very long, though half of that may just be caudal fin. Like all thresher sharks, it has a giant caudal fin lobe, short face, and relatively small mouth. It is most easily identified by the white coloration from the belly extending over the pectoral fins like it was wearing a backpack on its belly. It is found in open oceans all over the world, excluding the polar regions. The pelagic thresher, on the other hand, is found in most waters near the equator, but not in the Atlantic Ocean. It is not only smaller than its cousin, the common thresher, coming in at only around three meters, with half of that still just being tail, but it lacks the backpack with the ventral pattern not extending over the pectoral fins. The big eye thresher is smaller than the common thresher, but bigger than the pelagic thresher, coming in at around four meters, with some approaching five. They are obviously thresher sharks, as they have all of the normal thresher shark attributes, but you're unlikely to confuse them with the other two species, not because their eyes are that much larger, though they are larger, but more by the two big grooves behind their heads, which almost make it look like somebody stuck the head of another shark on their bodies. All thresher sharks are prized for their fins, meat, and oil, as well as being highly engaging sport fish as they commonly leap far out of the water when caught. But given that they have an extremely low reproductive rate, all three species are at very real risk of extinction from overharvesting. Big eye threshers seem to occupy a similar range to the common thresher, but they're active more at night and dive into deeper waters during the day, a rare shark behavior called dial vertical migration. That dial vertical migration is something that they share with the next most distantly related family of sharks, the crocodile sharks of the family Pseudocarcariidae. Crocodile sharks also inhabit pelagic waters around the globe near the equator, but they are much smaller than thresher sharks, about one meter, and lack the giant whip tail. They have big eyes and tiny fins, though their pelvic fins are almost the same size as their pectoral fins, and they have jaws full of spike-shaped teeth for catching fish, squid, and shrimp. Apparently, they're called crocodile sharks because of their crocodile-like teeth and habit of snapping a lot when captured, but it seems like a bit of a reach if you ask me. The remaining three families are all more related to one another than they are to any of the other lamniform sharks we have discussed so far. Possibly the least closely related of the remaining three are the megamouth sharks of the family Megachasmidae, though there is some debate about where they belong. And this is probably somewhat thanks to how weird they are. This is a deep water shark that has rarely been observed by humans. But unlike the goblin shark, which hunts large prey, the megamouth shark is a deep sea filter feeder. It is the smallest of the three filter feeding sharks, though the other two are the two largest fish in the world. So it still gets over five meters long with females growing larger than males. And I would argue that what it lacks in size as compared to the other two, it makes up for in being scarier looking. The deep sea seems to excel at that. Listen, you're a creature of the darkness. Nobody's gonna see you. But just in case they ever do, you should look terrifying. And this is a terrifying looking shark, especially considering that if you are bigger than a small jellyfish, it is totally harmless. This is evidenced by their tiny but freaky looking teeth. And to be perfectly honest, I don't know what, if anything, they do with those teeth because they hunt by swimming awkwardly around with their giant mouths open, catching tiny animals on their gill rakers. If you're ever out in the ocean, anywhere near the equator, and you see a big shark with a disproportionately large head and tiny teeth that seems like it is swimming for the first time and is still figuring it out, then there is a good chance that you are on the short list of people that have ever seen a megamouth shark. Really, the only shark you might confuse with a megamouth shark is the other filter feeding lamniform, the basking shark of the family Cetorhinidae. Which may explain why some people think that the megamouth shark belongs in this family as well. But the reality is that you aren't going to confuse the two. For one thing, the megamouth shark has a much larger upper lobe to its tail than the basking shark. And the basking shark looks like it isn't taking up swimming for the first time. They even breach, throwing themselves completely out of the water, which might be my favorite thing that I learned while researching this video. The basking shark frankly looks like a giant, toothless, dark-bellied great white shark. 
Basically what you would expect if a great white shark and a paddlefish had a baby, and then it grew to be much larger than either of them. This is the second largest fish alive today and the biggest of the lamniform sharks. Eight meters is typical and 12 is not unheard of. They also don't generally live where megamouth sharks live. Not only do they feed near the surface, but they are not really found near the equator, almost like they were avoiding it. Now they aren't really toothless, but the teeth are so small compared to the shark that I had to look up whether or not they had teeth. And not only do they have tiny teeth, but they also have the smallest brain to body ratio of any lamniform shark. But in their defense, they do have the most body. And the closest relatives to the basking sharks, assuming that it isn't the megamouth sharks, are the sand tiger sharks in the family Odonta spididae. Not to be confused with the tiger sharks in the order Carcariniformes, which I would be happy to dive into in a future video if you're into that kind of thing. No, the sand tiger sharks, despite their similar name to the more dangerous tiger shark and generally terrifying appearance, are no more dangerous to humans than are their nearly toothless cousins, the basking sharks. But those crazy teeth do make them look menacing and are responsible for one of their common names, the ragged toothed sharks. Sand tigers are easily identified by those teeth as well as their brownish dorsal coloration and very large secondary dorsal and anal fins. Reaching lengths of around three meters, these are not small sharks, but nowhere near as large as their cousins, the basking sharks. But they are pretty impressive when you see them in an aquarium. And due to their relatively simple care and placid demeanors, these are some of the only lamniforms commonly seen in captivity. So this may seem like the most unspectacular of the sharks we have discussed, but they do have a couple of unusual little secrets hidden inside. First, these guys use their needle-like teeth to hunt squid and bony fish mostly at night. That's no secret. But one big difference between sharks and bony fish is that sharks are heavier than water and bony fish are neutrally buoyant. We discussed this in some detail in our video on black-tipped reef sharks. Sharks must either be moving forward or sinking, while bony fish, because of an organ called a swim bladder, can remain suspended in one place in the water column without moving. They neither sink nor float. We discussed that in some detail in our video on African lungfish. Sharks cannot do this. Well, unless it's a sand tiger shark. Now that isn't to say that sand tiger sharks have a swim bladder. They don't. But they do have a stomach. And if you're a sand tiger shark and you gulp a big stomach full of air, well, you have something that works almost as well. I know of no other sharks that do this, though with over 400 species out there, it wouldn't blow my mind to discover another. But there is a more sinister secret hidden inside of them, or rather, inside of their mothers. We have discussed how members of this group tend to hatch inside of their mothers and many feed on unfertilized eggs, oophagy. That's cute. But what happens when the eggs run out and you're still hungry? Most sharks are simply born, but not sand tigers. Sand tigers are like Dwight. When my mother was pregnant with me, they did an ultrasound and found she was having twins. When they did another ultrasound, a few weeks later, they discovered that I had resorbed the other fetus. Do I regret this? No. I believe his tissues made me stronger. I now have the strength of a grown man and a little baby. Resorbed, in this case, is just a nice way of saying that they eat their siblings in utero. Intrauterine cannibalism is another term that you might use to sugarcoat this little unpleasantness as long as you don't spend any time analyzing it. Intra within, uterine uterus, cannibalism. Hey, I prefer the word adelphophagy. Now this has nothing to do with Adel. Adelphos is Greek for brother. Phagy, also Greek, for eating. Adelphophagy, how one gains the strength of a grown man and a little baby. It's right up there with conglobate and toxicognaths. Now, because sand tiger sharks have two uteruses, this means that they give birth to two Hunger Games victors at a time. This is a low birth rate, and this makes these sharks very susceptible to overfishing. Now, there are currently three species recognized as being part of the family Odontospididae, though there is considerable evidence to suggest that two of the three do not belong. 
The one that does belong is the sand tiger shark, or gray nurse shark. This is the one you tend to see in aquariums. The other two are probably more closely related to the thresher sharks. Somewhat unsurprising given the large upper lobe that all sand tiger shark caudal fins possess. The similarities between the sand tiger and the other two, the small toothed sand tiger and the big eye sand tiger, are likely due to convergent evolution and not shared ancestry. The true sand tiger is an impressive shark, coming in at over 3 meters, but the small tooth and the big eye both get bigger still. All three are found in shallow waters outside of the polar regions, though the true sand tiger is not found on the west coast of the Americas. The two most common are the true sand tiger and the small tooth sand tiger. They are also the two most difficult to tell apart. One of the easiest ways is not by looking at their teeth, surprisingly enough. Both have pretty long, spiky teeth. The small tooth may have somewhat smaller teeth, but it's really pretty hard to say. The easiest way, as far as I can tell, is by looking at the placement of their dorsal fins. On the sand tiger, it is located far back, partially over the pelvic fins. As a result, both the primary and secondary dorsal fins are located on the back half of the shark. With the small tooth sand tiger, the dorsal fin is located closer to the front, like most sharks, partially over the pectoral fins. As a result, they have one dorsal fin in their front half and one in the back half. The bottom lobe of their caudal fins is also more pronounced, but the dorsal fin location is your best giveaway. The big eye sand tiger is highly uncommon to see. Its fins are located in about the same position as its closest relative, the small tooth sand tiger, but it can easily be identified because it is brown everywhere, including the belly, whereas the other sand tigers have light bellies. Also, the secondary dorsal fin is about half the size of the primary, unlike the other two sand tigers. But if you see a raggedy toothed shark that is brown from top to bottom, you know what you found. And that covers every single species of lamniform shark alive today. So what's your favorite lamniform shark? And what group should we cover next? As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. And they have a very distinctive lateral keel on the caudal peduncle, where the caudal fin attaches to the tail. <laughs> oh, sorry, my peduncle's acting up. Probably, <laughs> probably better pronounced peduncle. I don't know. Nope. The sand tiger sharks, despite their... Nope. 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 The... <laughs> no. No. I don't know how this... Okay. Okay? Let me see the last line before... <laughs> no, let me see the last line. This means that they give birth to two Hunger Games victors at a time. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> it's terrible.